Um, Akil's first book, An Obedient Father, won the Penn Hemingway Award and was a New York Times Notable Book of the Year. His new book, Family Life, is the story of two brothers and their immigration from India to the U.S. in the late 70s. Adjusting to life in New York City comes with its challenges and joys for the family, but then tragedy strikes as a diving accident leaves one brother severely brain damaged. But this semi-autobiographical tale, um, even with its weight, is not without humor and spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, Akhil Sharma. So my name, every, can everybody hear me? No? Okay. Is, this, is it working? Okay. What about that? Okay. Slightly better. Uh, okay, what about this? Better? All right. Well, we'll... Actually, why don't the people who are in the back move up front? <laughs> you know, I teach, and I oftentimes have the same issue with my students. <laughs> Everybody hides. <laughs> it's, w th you know, it's, w thank you very much for coming. Uh, I spent 12 and a half years writing this thing. Uh, and I say this thing because I feel anger and uh, some mild contempt. You know, like when you've been in an abusive relationship, you're full of uh, hatred towards the, the, the abuser and hatred towards yourself. And so I call my book this thing. Uh, so thank you for coming. Um, it's, uh, <coughs> it's, it feels like an enormous relief for the book to be done uh, and for it to be, to be now sort of read by people. You know, it, it feels very special. The... A part of me still doesn't believe that the book is done. A part of me still thinks that I'm going to be made to go revise it. <laughs> so I'm, the, the book is very true to life. Uh, I drew quite heavily on the book, uh, on my own life. When, before I began writing it, I asked my parents' permission if they were okay with me writing it. Uh, and they said, sure. My, my mother's response to my writing the story was to say, Akhil, just make me look good. <laughs> and my father, who doesn't read and is depressive, said, said about writing, my, writing this book, Akhil, if you want to keep a secret, put it in a book. <laughs> so when I finished the book, um, I said to my father, do you want to read it? And he said, why? I was there. <laughs> and you know, I love my parents. You know, the, all these things which in somebody else would be weird or annoying, in my own family I find delightful <laughs> and uh, just sort of one more reason to love them. Um, and when I, when I was talking to my mother, uh, she asked my permission to not read it. <laughs> she, she said, Akhil, it, it was just so sad and I don't want to remember it, which to me is a valid thing, you know. Um, the when I began writing this book, one thing I did not, one thing I wanted. Okay, let me let me back up. When I wrote my first book, what I really wanted was to write a book that people would read and they would think, "Boy, this is a good book." And with this book, what I wanted was to write a book that would be useful. You know, it's about my brother and my parents and the the accident that my brother had in a swimming pool and how we kept him in a hospital for two years and then we brought him home and took care of him and the havoc this, this caused. And after my brother died, uh, which was about two years ago, I think we all became filled with tenderness. Um, my, I think when somebody you love dies, I think if you're mentally healthy, you want to, you don't want to add to any more pain in the world. You know, you just want to add to whatever goodness there might be. And so, for example, we had all this equipment, you know, all this medical equipment and things like that that we could have sold. I mean, I made a little bit of money. And we had this van, this van with a, a ramp and, you know, one of those wheelchair things that, that lower and, and rise. 
which we could have sold for about 11,000 bucks, but my parents just donated it to another family with a sick child because it was just, we would rather, you become full of tenderness. And so when I was writing this book, it felt almost too important to write a book that it felt like this was so important that I didn't want to write a book that was good. I wanted to write a book that would be useful. That is, uh, a lot of, everybody uh, will either has dealt with illness or will deal with illness. Everybody has dealt with d the death of loved ones or will deal with the death of loved ones. And so little things which are shocking and strange when we experience them become less shocking and strange uh, if we have had the experience of reading about them in advance uh, or even after an event. So for example, I remember um, um, after my brother brother's accident, I used to cry all the time. And at some point I actually felt relieved. Uh, I actually felt, del I was glad to cry. I was glad to be unhappy because that unhappiness, that weeping, had the impression of him, of my brother's personality. You know, that weeping, that loss, had some of his, con some of the contours of his personality. Uh, the, and I remember reading in Shakespeare, there's a, in one of the history plays, this man says to a queen whose son has died, that, you know, that her, her crying is unreasonable, that she needs to let go of this grief. And she says, you know, she says, uh, um, my grief lies in my son's bed. It stuffs itself into his clothes and walks beside me, prattling in his pretty tongue. If you had grief like mine, would you not love it too? And I remember reading that and thinking, oh, this was exactly my experience. And so what I wanted with this book was to write a book that would be useful, that would help people. Um, and that causes a change in in the in the in the sentences, it causes a change in certain uh, in word choices in diction. That is, the transitions between paragraphs are not as forceful. In the first book, when a paragraph ended, the ending of the paragraph would push the reader into the next paragraph, and the next paragraph would grab the reader. With this one, because the intention the intention I had was to be a little bit useful, the idea was to welcome to make the transitions between the paragraphs soft. So the reader did not have to go on. The reader could, but he did not have to. It was a way of meeting the reader and saying to the reader, okay, uh, we can stop here if you want. We can continue if you, w if you want, but we can stop here as, if you want. So I'll point these things out to you as I, as I read, as I do my, l my reading. As far back as I can remember, my parents have bothered each other. In India, we lived in two concrete rooms on the roof of a house. The bathroom stood separate from the living quarters. The sink was attached to one of the exterior walls. Each night, my father would stand before the sink, the sky above him full of stars, and brush his teeth until his gums bled. Then he would spit the blood into the sink and turn to my mother and say, Death, Shuba, death. No matter what we do, we will all die. Yes, yes, beat drums, my mother said once. Tell the newspapers too. Make sure everyone knows this thing you have discovered. Like many people of her generation, those born before independence, my mother viewed gloom as unpatriotic. <laughs> to complain was to show that you were not willing to accept difficulties, that you were not willing to do the hard work that was needed to build the country. My father was only two years older than my mother. Unlike her, he saw dishonesty and selfishness everywhere. Not only did he see these things, but he believed that everybody else did too, and that, everybody, and that people were deliberately not acknowledging what they saw. My mother's irritation at his spitting blood, he interpreted as hypocrisy. So, so the, you know, the, a book is, n at least the way that I write, um, m I think a lot about what am I trying to do, what do I, you know, w what is the effect of this particular sentence upon the reader, um, because I find that if I just write automatically or instinctively, uh, I end up sounding like some blend of writers that I have read. 
So for me, the re I often begin with my whatever I write with a fight. So I begin with as far back as I can remember, my parents have bothered each other because there's a promise of a fight. And the reason I begin this way is because human beings love fights. You know, somebody could be performing Hamlet here. If two people in the back begin punching each other, we'll all turn around to look at those guys. That's human nature. So as a writer, I think, let's take advantage of it. And so once... So once I've hooked my reader's interest in s with, a, with a little thing like this, a little device like this, then I begin creating the physical world. <laughs> in India, we lived in two concrete rooms on the roof of a house. The reason I begin this way, uh, the reason I switch to building up the physical world, is I find that readers then know how to invest in the world. That is, if I can present a world that is physical, W the reader knows what kind of world he or she is entering, and the reader is much more comfortable uh, investing in it. There's chairs here if you guys would like to come up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there's chairs here. Uh, so, so, that's, so there's the promise of the fight and then this thing. And the physical world is a way for the reader to know, okay, this is an ordinary life, an ordinary world, you know, uh, which is which is important for the reader to know, versus you know something like Kafka. Uh, you're just sell telling, the sig telling the reader how to interpret the narrative. And then I tend to write funny. I, you know, for me, mostly human beings are, are weird creatures. You know, we're so strange you know, we, I, uh, that it's delightful to watch our, you know, if you were to watch yourself from the outside all day, I'm sure you would laugh many times. And and so it makes sense to me that uh, <coughs> that the that the parents would talk in this way. You know, the father brushing his teeth uh, and saying, uh, "We will death, shuba death. We will all die." To me, this is what a human being does. Human beings do all this weird stuff, especially when we're in very intimate situations. You know, outside in public, we try to hold it together, <laughs> but with each other in our marriages, in our relationships, we the freak flag fr flies. Uh, I also know that the book is done, that the book is fully baked when certain qualities begin to appear in the prose. So for me, I, when I have senten w sentences where beautiful things appear right next to gross things, physically gross things, then I know that, okay, this is, this is, this is doing what I want it to do. So for example, when I have a sentence like, each night uh, my father would stand before the sink, the sky above him full of stars, and brush his teeth until his gums bled. Because for me, oftentimes, beautiful things are next to ridiculous things. Beautiful things are next to ugly things. And that's part of humanity and part of sort of feeling joy in the world. You know, that we can, ha we can, we can have a day that we spend in hospitals, and yet the day is beautiful. You know, we look out the, d out the window and we think, oh, how beautiful it is how beautiful the sky is, you know, or uh, how, look at how the clouds are hurrying across, that we can have moments of tremendous gratitude even inside moments of tremendous difficulties. There's a seat here if you would like. Uh, the other w thing that I'm, um, that I, which when I see I realize that I begin to think, okay, this thing is almost done, is when I begin to s have characters where I, I like it when everybody is right and everybody is wrong. Uh, to me, that's sort of a sign of humanity. So, for example, you know, the mother's point of view is correct. Like, what is the point of gloom? Like, how am I making my life easier by being gloomy, right? All I'm doing is adding to the burden, adding to the friction of living my life. So she is correct in, in her point of view. But she's also, the reason she's choosing this point of view is because it's a way of sort of appearing proper to the world. And so her motivation, which is to, to appear a certain way, is incorrect because it is giving the world power over her. And so that is her being right and that is her being wrong. The father is pointlessly cynical. But if you've lived in India, you know, it's useful to be cynical. <laughs> and so th in that sense, he too is right and also simultaneously wrong. 
this book doesn't have a plot. You know, there isn't a very strong causation. You know, this the family comes to America. They, you know, they do what immigrants do, which is they strive for certain things. They, a, a terrible tragedy occurs, which causes other decisions. But there isn't causation. That is, A is not necessarily forcing B. A occurs, and then B comes about because of who these people are. But they also had other choices at that time that they chose, that they did not follow through on. Because of that, because of the absence of plot, as a writer, you have to think in terms of how do I make this th experience pleasant for the reader? And one of the ways to do so is by having small sections. That is, I have most of the book, the sections are a page and a half, two and a half pages long. Each chapter is seven, eight, nine, ten sections. And the idea is that when we as readers read, when we finish a section, we feel a little sense of satisfaction. Like, ah, I've accomplished something. And that's good. You know, and it serves as a little motivation for the reader to move forward. The problem is that when you have sections, uh, you, each time a new section starts, you're asking the reader to recommit, which is a problem. And so you have to have a stylistic thing that responds to that. For me, just because of who I am, oftentimes that recommitment occurs in the form of humor. Um, so now I'm going to do, I'm going to read the next section. So my mother's irritation at his spitting blood, he interpreted as hypocrisy. My new section, my father was an accountant. He had wanted to immigrate to the West ever since he was in his early 20s, ever since America liberalized its immigration policies in 1965. His wish rose out of self-loathing. Often when he walked down the street in Delhi, he would feel that the buildings he passed were indifferent to him, that he mattered so little to them that he might as well not have been born. Because he attributed this feeling to his circumstances and not to the fact that he was the sort of person who sensed buildings having opinions of him, <laughs> he believed that if he were somewhere else, especially somewhere where he was paid in dollars and thus was rich, he would be a different person and one whose life had meaning. Another reason he wanted to emigrate was that he saw the West as glamorous with the excitement of science. In India in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, radios, televisions, and cars were not just expensive objects, but seen as almost supernatural. I remember that when we turned on the radio in our apartment, <coughs> as the vacuum tubes warmed up, first the voices would sound far away, and then they would rush at us. And this was thrilling, as if the machine were making some special effort just for us. Of everybody in my family, my father loved science the most. He tried to bring it into his life by going to medical clinics and having his urine tested. He loved clinics and doctor's offices. Of course, hypochondria had something to do with this. <laughs> my father suspected that there was something wrong with him and that, it, and that it might be something physical. Also, sitting in the clinics and talking to doctors in lab coats, he felt that he was close to important things, that what the doctors were doing was the same as what doctors would do in England or Germany or America, that he was already there in those foreign countries. <coughs> my mother had no interest in emigrating for herself. She was a high school economics teacher, and she liked her job. But she thought that the West would provide me and my brother Birju with opportunities. Then came the emergency. Indira Gandhi suspended the Constitution and put thousands of politicians and journalists in jail. My parents, like almost everyone who had seen independence come, were very loyal. They were the sort of people who looked up at a cloud and thought, that's an Indian cloud. <laughs> After the emergency, however, they began to think that even though they were ordinary and unlikely to get into political trouble, it might still be better to emigrate. The, you know, because there isn't plot, I am forced to use exposition more in this novel than I was in my first one. The ex exposition, however, by its very nature is undramatic and so doesn't feel full of life. And so I have to put in life in some other way. And so that life comes through this representation of human beings as human beings. It also comes through uh, these, through laughter, because when we can laugh, we begin to feel like, oh, this is what it means to be, we become alive. The laughter makes us alive and it makes the prose alive. <coughs> the,
the the business of this section, which was just to prepare the reader for for the family immigrating, actually didn't need to take more than four or five sentences. The section, however, is about 26 sentences. And so what the book is doing, what the writing is doing, is focusing always on the characters. It's always about these people and to a much lesser extent about the story, about the plot. It's only these characters being made alive. So next section. And again, watch for the humor because this is it's sort of my thumbprint. I used to assume that my father had been assigned to us by the government. <laughs> this was because he appeared to serve no purpose. <laughs> when he got home in the evening, all he did was sit in his chair in the living room, drink tea, and read the paper. Often he looked angry. By the time we left for America, when I was eight and Bridget was 12, I knew that the government had not assigned him to live with us. Still, I continued to think that he served no purpose. <laughs> My father, who had gone to America a year before us, was waiting for us in the arrivals hall at the airport. He was leaning against a metal railing and looking irritated. The sight of him made me anxious. The apartment he had rented was in a tall brown brick building in Queens. The gray metal front door swung open into a foyer with a wooden floor. Beyond this was a living room with a reddish brown carpet that went from wall to wall. I had never seen a carpet except in movies. Bridget and my parents walked across the foyer and into the living room. I went to the carpet's edge and stopped. A brass strip held the carpet to the floor. I took a step forward, trying not to put my weight down. I felt as if I were stepping on, onto a painting. My father took us to the bathroom to show us toilet paper and hot water. Whereas my mother was interested in status, in being better educated than others or being considered more respectable, my father was simply interested in having more things. I think this was because while both of my parents had grown up poor, my father's childhood had been much more desperate. At some point, at some point my father's father had begun to believe that thorns were growing out of his palms. He had taken a razor and picked at his hands until they were shaggy with scraps of skin. Because of my grandfather's problems, my father had grown up feeling that no matter what he did, people would look down on him. As a result, he cared less about trying to convince people of his merits and more about just possessing things. The bathroom was narrow. It had a tub, a sink, and a toilet in a row along one wall. My father reached between Bridget and me and turned on the tap. Hot water came shaking and steaming into the basin. He stepped back and looked at us to gauge our reaction. I had never seen hot water coming from a tap before. In India, in the winter, my, fa my mother used to get up early to heat pots of water on the, on the stove so that we could bathe. Watching the hot water spill out as if, there was a, the, as if there were an endless supply, I had the sense of being in a fairy tale, one of those stories with a jug that is always full of milk or a bag of food that never empties. That night, I went to bed on a mattress in the living room. The apartment had one bedroom where my parents slept. Even in my sleep, I was aware that I was in America. As the days passed, the wealth of this new country continued to astonish me. There were the programs on television from morning to night. In our, shi in our shiny brass mailbox in the lobby, we received ads on colored paper. The sliding glass doors of our apartment building would open when we approached. Each time they did this, I felt that we had been mistaken for somebody important. M my father, who had seemed pointless in India, had brought us to America, and now we were rich. The fact that he had achieved this made him seem different, mysterious. All the time now, he was saying things that revealed him as knowledgeable. In India, my mother had been the one who made the decisions considering Birju and me. Now I realized that my father, too, had opinions about us. This felt both surprising and intrusive, like being touched by a relative you don't know well. My father took Birju and me to a library. I had been in two libraries before then. One in a small, noisy room next to a barber shop had had newspapers but not books and had been used primarily by people searching the employment ads. The other had been on the second floor of a temple and had had books, but they were kept locked in a glass-fronted cabinet. The library in Queens was bigger than either of the ones I had seen. It had several rooms and thousands of books. The librarian said that we could check out as many as we wanted. I did not believe this at first. My father told Birju and me that he would give us 50 cents for each book we read. This bribing struck me as un-Indian and wrong. My mother had told us that Americans were afraid to demand things from their children. She'd said that this was because American parents did not care about their children and were, and were unwilling to do the hard work of disciplining them. If my father wanted us to read, what he should do was threaten to beat us. 
I wondered whether my father had become too American during the year that he had lived uh, alone. I wanted to check out 10 picture books. My father said, you think I'm going to give you money for such small books? <laughs> my mother, Birju, and I had taken everything we could from the airplane. Red Air India blankets, pillows with paper <laughs> pillowcases, headsets, sachets of ketchup, packets of salt and pepper, air sickness bags. Birju and I used the blankets until they frayed and tore. Around that time, we started going to school. I had a shy nature. You're a tiger at home, my mother said, and a cat outside. At school, I sat at the very back of the class in the row closest to the door. Often, I could not understand what my teacher was saying. I had studied English in India, but either my teacher spoke too quickly and used words I did not know, or else I was so afraid that her words sounded garbled to my ears. You know, the, um, if I were, if I had spoken earlier about tight transitions versus very soft transitions. So <coughs> the first paragraph here of this section ends with, around that time we started going to school. If I wanted a tight transition, the next paragraph would have begun with, at school I sat at the very back of the class. That is, the paragraph ends by pushing you forward, and then the next paragraph grabs you. But that's not something I want in this book for various reasons, one of which is I want the book to be available to the reader, but not press itself upon the reader. And so I put in a break, I put in a dampener, such as this sentence, I had a shy nature, you're a tiger at home, you're, my mother said, and a cat outside. So all these things are part of what, to some extent, these are very conscious choices and very technical choices. To a large extent, all they are, they are responses, automatic intuitive responses to what the intention is for writing the book. The intention of the book is to be of comfort or to provide access to experience that might be useful. But in, the, you know, if I, my mother likes to give advice when I don't want it, <laughs> right? And oftentimes when you offer an unsolicited advice, it feels like an attack. And so what I try to do is I present this uh, I don't do that. You know, I just provide, inf I allow the reader to come, to move through the book at his or her own, her own pace. So, uh, I had studied English in India, but either my teacher spoke too quickly and used words I did not know, or else I was so afraid that her words sounded garbled to my ears. It was strange to be among so many whites. They all looked alike. When a boy spoke to me between periods, it would take me a moment to realize that I had talked to him before. The school was three stories tall with hallways that looped on themselves and stairways connecting the floors like a giant game of snakes and ladders. Not only could I not tell white people apart, but often I got lost trying to find my classroom. Soon I became so afraid of getting lost in the vastness of the school that I wouldn't leave the classroom when I had to use the toilet. We had lunch in an asphalt yard surrounded by a high chain link fence. Wheeled garbage cans were spread around the yard. I was often bullied. Sometimes a little boy would come up to me and tell me that I smelled bad. Then, if I said anything, a bigger boy would appear so suddenly that I couldn't tell where he had come from. He'd knock me down, then stand over me, fist clenched, and demand, you want to fight, you want to fight? Sometimes boys surrounded me and shoved me back and forth, keeping me upright as a kind of game. Often, standing in a corner in the, of the asphalt yard, I would think, there has been a mistake. I'm good at cricket. I'm good at marbles. I'm not the sort of boy who is pushed around. The, you know, when I was writing this book, part of my motivation was to memorialize my family. You know, my family, we're ordinary people, and so we're going to be forgotten, you know, which is okay, you know, that's fine. But I wanted to preserve them, and so when I had the choice between using a detail from life and a, de and a fictional detail, I would choose a detail from life. Part of my motivation was also memorializing my community and especially the first generation of immigrants, those who came in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Uh, my, you know, the first generation of immigrants is running so hard, they're so anxious, that many of the details of their life get forgotten. You know, when we, when we stop being afraid, it's hard to remember how afraid we used to be. When we stop being poor, it's hard to remember how, how much it sucked to be poor. Uh, and, so I put in details which are recognizable to the Indian community, like the details of how uh, we would take everything from the airplane. You know, whatever wasn't nailed down, we would bring home. 
So, for example, we used to bring those headsets that they had for the airplanes to, for those, to watch the movies. They looked like stethoscopes, uh, and they were totally useless. Like, you could not use them at home, yet we would bring them home. Uh, and another thing that is sort of forgotten is how violent it used to be to be an Indian. Like, how, uh, how much racism there was, and how much of that racism was physically violent. Uh, and I was talking to an acquaintance, a businessman who's very successful, who was saying that it's hard for his children to believe that when he was in, in school, kids would come up to him just and sh just shove him into lockers to start a fight. Uh, and that too, I wanted to preserve. You know, I don't. You know, I love America. You know, I feel very, very fortunate to be here, and I personally think that America has changed a lot. Like, but it's important to remember what that world was like. Um, have I? How f how am I running? Am I late? Um, because I've been advised to do 20, 25 minutes. We got a few more minutes before questions. Okay. I'll read um, just a little bit more because some of my favorite jokes are coming up. <laughs> For me, the two best things about America were television and the library. Every Saturday night, I watched The Love Boat. I looked at the women in their one-piece bathing suits and their high heels and imagined what it would be like when I was married. I decided that when I was married, I would be very serious and my silences would lead to misunderstandings between me and my wife. We would fight and later make up and, a kiss, make up and kiss. She would be wearing a white swimsuit as we kissed. You know the um, there's the the book ends with in, in near a swimming pool with a woman wearing a white swimsuit. It's not the sort of detail that most readers would remember, but I think if you're a writer, you have to pay attention to the details. You know, it's, God is in the details. Before coming to America, I had never read a book just to read it. At first, when I began doing so, whatever I read seemed obviously a lie. If a book said a, said that a boy walked into a room. I was immediately aware that there was no boy and there was no room. Still, I read so much that I began to imagine myself in the books I read. I imagined being Pinocchio, swallowed by a whale. I wished to be inside a whale with the candle burning on a wooden crate, as in the illustration. Vanishing into books, I felt held. While I was at school or walking down the street, there seemed no end to the world. When I read a book or watched The Love Boat, the world felt simple and understandable. Bridgu liked America much more than I did. In India, he had not been very popular. Here, he made friends quickly. He was in seventh grade, and his English was better than mine. Also, he was kinder than he had been in India. In India, there had been such competition, so many people offering bribes to get their children slightly better grades that he was always on edge. Here, doing well seemed as simple as studying. My school was, was on the way to Birju's, and Birju used to walk me there every day. One morning, I started crying and told him about the bullying. He suggested that I talk to our parents. When I did not, he told, he told them himself. My father came to school with me. I had to stand at the front of the class and point at all the boys who had shoved me or threatened me. After this, the bullying stopped. I had been angry that Bridgu had told our parents. I had not thought that this would make a difference. The fact that it did surprised me. My mother took a job in a garment factory. The morning that she was to start, she came into the living room wearing jeans. I had never seen her in something form-fitting before. Birju and I were sitting on a mattress. Your thighs look like turnips, Birju said. M my mother started screaming, die, murderer, die. <laughs> Birju laughed and I laughed too. In India, when my father said that we should do something, we wouldn't really start doing it until our mother had decided whether it should be done. In America, our parents had closer to equal authority. My father had all sorts of plans for us. Mostly these involved ways to assimilate. He made us watch the news every evening. This was incredibly boring. We didn't care that there, were, that there were hostages in Iran or that there was a movie called The Empire Strikes Back. He also bought us tennis rackets and took us to Flushing Meadow, Meadows Park. There he made us hit tennis balls because he believed that tennis was a sport for rich people. My father was still irritable and suspicious the way he had been in India, but he also had a certain confidence, as if no matter what happened, he had done one thing that was uncontest uncontestably wonderful. A green card is worth a million dollars, he repeatedly told us. I'm going to stop there. Um, <laughs> you're, uh, thank, you, thank you very much for coming. The, uh, it's weird, having written this book, 
I now want this book to do stuff for me, <laughs> right? You know, I wanted to sell lots of copies and make me money. I wanted to win prizes and get me attention. <coughs> but I now, you know, it's, I also realize it's a little bit like a, a parent raising a child and then wanting the child to go out and make him money. <laughs> and the most wonderful part of this, of giving readings is to meet audience members and to listen to them and to realize that, that the book has its own life, that now the book is, the book, now my relationship to the book is much less important and in some ways much less real than the relationship the book has with the reader. You know, that that's where the, that's now what is the life of the book. So it's a real pleasure to get to meet you guys. Thank you. Um, you began by describing your multi-year struggle with this book, your relief at finishing what you called the thing that you had this relationship of abuser and abused with. But wasn't this struggle also therapeutic? Um, you, in, you know, everything has good things, right? So I couldn't be in a bad relationship and at the end of it realize, well, I've learned how to practice self-care by avoiding crazy people, <laughs> right? So everything has good things in it. Uh, and so to the, extent that ex to the extent that I gained certain things from writing this book, it's, I, it is certainly true. Uh, books are not therapy. They should not be therapy. Uh, and also, if, if I knew... If I knew then what I know now, I certainly would not have begun this book. I'm glad the book exists. I think it's a very good book. But I also, uh, I wish some other schmuck had written it. <laughs> so. uh, you said that your book was autobiographical. Yep. Um, what guided you to choose the novel format rather than a memoir? Sure. That's a really good question. I think there are couple of things. One, the most important thing is simply that I write fiction, right? So I can, uh, I know how to write fiction. I know how to do it. I know how to generate experience. I don't know <coughs> how to do that uh, with nonfiction. So for example, uh, with nonfiction, I wouldn't be able to use dialogue because I, th I cannot credibly claim to remember what people said 30 years ago, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I, would ha I would be forced to include things which were important, but which don't interest me. So for example, much of my childhood was full of boredom. And I don't want to write about boredom, and yet it was an important part of my life. So I would be forced to write a book I didn't want to write. So those were the two things. And probably the third thing was, you know, if I were writing this thing as, as memoir, if I was claiming that everything in it existed, actually existed in, in reality, then I, when I, while writing it, I would have felt like my mother was standing right behind me looking at me. So that was the that would be the third reason. Thank you. So I have a question a bit related. So you said that in your writing you use you prefer to choose to use details coming from reality. In in this book, in, in this, this book, book not yes. not in the previous one or not in, in other fiction. But in this one. Yes. So to choose detail coming from reality rather than from your imagination. So but still you write fiction. So how did you um, integrate like these details coming from reality into the book in order like to still create like an homogeneous fiction. Sure. Like because for us like a uh, reader, uh, we don't know like what was your reality. So it could be like also part of the fiction, but you know as a writer that it's not. It's details coming from reality, but still like in order to make it like uh, a book, like a fiction, something like literary, you probably had to work also like on these details like coming from uh, reality in order to make something sure. homogeneous. So, so how did you some of the details are from my life and some of them I made up, right? There, there's a danger when you're doing something like that that the quality of these two s types of details are different. That is, the details that are imagined feel less real than the details that are from life. And it just takes a long time and just, you know, I wrote 7,000 pages and the book is about 200 pages. And so there was a, 
I mean, I went through and kept trying to find the details that would be full of life uh, until it felt like one entity. So it felt like it was a, it all had the same quality of reality. Um, the book goes, it sort of unfolds um, at a, it seems like kind of a leisurely pace until the end. And then zzz, you go to college and then you have this very, um, I thought, enigmatic last line about being happy and realizing that you are really in trouble. And I wondered if you would speak to that because I was very curious about that. Uh, I appreciate your desire for that, but I feel like talking about the ending before an audience w which has not read it might not be the, might not be kind. Uh, I'm happy to talk to you afterwards. Yeah. That's okay. So I have so many questions and so many things to say. Uh, principally, I think that as I sat here listening to you and I've heard some of your previous interviews, uh, I have been so struck by the way in which you capture how complicated family love is. Uh, it's, you know, it's deep, it's ridiculous, uh, it's, it's painful, it's all those things, and, and it's funny. Um, and so I am really looking forward to meeting and knowing um, your family in this book. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I mean, like you, I'm, I certainly have a, a complicated family. And uh, it's very, uh, it's humbling and it's comforting to hear them written, to hear about your family, to read about your family um, uh, with so much love. Um, I'll ask you one question about what you said earlier uh, about how you like to provide physical detail to invest the reader in the story. Will you talk a bit about that? Uh, the Where you place physical detail m has an physical, depending on where you place physical details, uh, physical details serve different purposes depending on where they are placed. So physical detail in the second paragraph serve as a way not just to establish the world, but a, 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 but as a way to tell the reader what is the type of narrative that he or she is reading. So when you present physical details in the second paragraph, the reader realizes that this is a narrative which is based on a, it's a basically mimetic narrative. That is, it's, it's uh, a narrative which is trying to replicate life. Mm -hmm. The type of physical details that I use in this book. Uh, and one of the things that took forever to figure out is when you're writing a, a story without plot, with very little weak plot, what you're d one of the issues you run into is that it's hard to bring the reader into a scene and exit him out of the scene. Because that transaction, that mo in and going in and out of a scene generates friction for the reader. And so if the payoff for reading the scene is limited, that is, you're only going to get a small thing, small plot bang for it. Then the reader begins to feel that the scenes are running too s too long. So for me, what was interesting was I had been reading Chekhov, and I realized how strongly he generates the use of present tense by using certain parts of the sensorium. So by using sound a lot, which is uh, which is not something that people tend to do, using smell, using the feel of. Uh, Mm. Uh, sunlight on on your skin. So s certain aspects of the sensorium he uses a lot, and he very he doesn't use visual details much. And so I began thinking, okay, what can I do? I thought if he's using this to generate present tense, maybe I can use this to uh, reverse out present tense. That is, I can make visceral reality less visceral. And so I went through, and there's there's almost no sound in this book. There's almost no smell in this book. There's almost no scene where somebody talks about, you know, the feel of sun on their on the back of their neck, uh, and so these were 
so physical details, the sensorium um, is being used here in a way that is very different. And so by creating a thinned out reality, it becomes, the reader has experiences less friction entering and mm -hmm. exiting scenes. The benefit, the problem of doing that is that writers tend to use certain techniques all the time because those are those generate the the strongest feeling of reality if you're going to thin out reality then you need to put in something else to replace it and so i began putting in humor exposition uh, all these other types of details as a way to rep to uh, handle what i had done by removing those details mm. I'm going to ask you one very quick question. Why, why did you, uh, or I don't know, why, how, uh, did you edit those 7,000 pages to what looks like a couple of hundred pages? It isn't, um, it isn't really editing. What I did was uh, whenever I would begin a new draft, I would just open up a blank document. So it isn't, the only time I really edited was in the last six months or so. That's where I was going through and sort of wordsmithing. So it was basically just new novel after new novel after new novel. I mean, I wrote the novel from the point of view of the father, from the point of view of the mother. Uh, for about seven years, it was in third person. So it was, I mean, there were whole, there were many novels which look nothing like this. Mm. Thank you. I've read the novel and many interviews about the novel, and I'm struck by the fact that every time you talk about the novel, you talk about the novel in terms of craft. I've been to a number of readings here at Politics and Prose, and typically when a writer talks about their work, they talk about the plot, they talk about what might have motivated this character to do this or that, why this ha thing happened, then the next thing happened. But I've noticed that even in your talk today, you stopped after a paragraph, you might explain what the motivation was for this paragraph, why you constructed a sentence in a particular way, and I noticed that you've done the same in your interviews as well. So I'm just wondering why you're taking the readers through the craft perspective and if you wanted to influence the way the readers read your work or if it's just about you kind of accessing the work and talking to us about it. Um, you know, for me, the only thing that really is, if I don't, <coughs> mostly read, writers read the same to me, right? They they, to me, mostly writers are a blend of other writers. Uh, and it's rare for writers to be truly distinctive, you know. And this is why there aren't that many really special writers. And part of the one of the reasons I feel that craft matters is that it's through craft that we become uh, more of ourselves. You know, we become ourselves through these sort of details. the The book becomes more itself through this sort of craft. Um, in the end, that's the only th the only thing that matters is how do you get the book to work, and if you're going to get the book to work, how effectively can you get it alive and moving about? Uh, I mean, I could have written this book, you know, a long time ago and in a much faster way uh, than I did, and. But that book wouldn't have had the qualities that this book does. Uh, so, I mean, I think so. For me, the only thing that really matters is is the writing at the level of the sentence or the word. That's one thing. Um, in terms of plot, you know, for me, plot is sort of pointless, uh, or even characterization is sort of pointless because I feel uh, we. I I mean a wide I could have picked uh, any human being can do many different things uh and so and or you can have almost any type of plot there's almost n there's almost no limit to what is possible in plot or in, in characterization it and that just actually it doesn't seem that interesting to me you know neither plot nor characterization have ever appealed they feel so amorphous, whereas technical stuff, like what's going on, on a, in a sentence, that's something that I can really grasp. And then the other reason I talk so often about it is, uh, well, there's two reasons. Uh, one is, man, if you spend 12 and a half years writing something, you want people to notice all the hard work you've yeah. done. Uh, 
and then the other is god knows how many times i've met people who think they can just sit down and write a book <laughs> i you know i believe you that you can sit down and write a book and i you know it might even be possible that if you are talented and smart you can sit down and write a book which will be published it would surprise me if you could sit down and write a book uh and publish it and that book uh endure you know so if we look at dostoevsky dostoevsky's first book you know poor folk that book only is still in print only because he over time he became better and better at what he was doing at his craft he became more and more himself and so because of that the the first things that he did endure um that's a very long and complicated way of answering your question just to continue off his observation i really i really like your presentation um especially because you're talking about it feels like a writer's workshop which is really nice um just everything we're learning from it and i was wondering also since you said that some of this is autobiographical as a writer how did you feel comfortable to talk about your family cuz even what you've shared so far there are parts that maybe if your family read reads this how did you how did you decide or what was it like to decide that the work was more important than maybe the reaction of the ones you're close to uh you know my personal s- some people have said to me that um uh, it might make um, that some of these things might make my family look bad you know certain things in the story uh in the novel i sort of feel you know you can't only love the lovable right like um uh, there's a value in presenting people with flaws because then when they love you then it's then when you love this person you're actually loving the real person when i was um when people would when people have told me that they love me my first response is to tell them but what about this thing that you, that i've done maybe you don't know it like i've done this awful thing or that bad thing or here's something that fills me with shame because i find it hard to believe that somebody loves me and then once i've told them these things and they say yes yes you know this is what it means to be a human being you know we're messy human beings are messy you know we're we're perpetual construction sites you know when pe- when and then i feel okay you know then 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 i feel then when that person says that 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 they love me i actually think okay i am loved and so for me the presenting people in a light that is unflattering is actually giving them an opportunity to be loved uh i mean that's how i perceive it the and then the other thing is look i if i'm sitting on an airplane right i get irritated very quickly and uh, just because of the stress and annoyance of that but imagine if you had to take care of a sick child for years and years and years imagine if you had no money you know imagine you know imagine you were an immigrant and you know insurance company scared you how well would you behave and so this idea that we should expect these people to behave wonderfully you know it means you know nothing about life if you think that hi thank you um writing is not easy um english is uh, not your native language i'm kind of curious to know at what point you felt comfortable in terms of writing and what was the journey like until that point you know i came to america when i was 8 so english is my native language it isn't my mother tongue it it isn't what i was born with but when i speak hindi i speak like a a fifth grader right so i can't i can't speak in a very sophisticated way um uh, the j- the journey i experienced in terms of writing in english is the journey that every writer does which is learning how to write badly tolerating your bad stuff and then you know continuing to do it continuing to move forward that was sort of it's like with everything else you know you fail and you fail and you fail and then you improve a tiny bit you improve a li- if you can you know if you if you can change a little bit then you can change a little bit more if you can change a little bit more you can change a little bit more beyond that and that's sort of how you do it it's like anything else you know progress we're aiming for progress uh, you know, d- we have one more question um so 
uh, Gary Steingart and Chang Rae Lee um, had this um, kind of conversation in um, Vulture recently. And they said something about immigrant fiction and how it is by its own very nature dystopian. I was wondering what you thought about that. Um, and whether you were in some way also just inserting yourself into a tradition of immigrant fiction, um, clearly a departure from your first book and um, talking, and it's certainly a lot of what you said resonated with me, um, you know, you know, the changes in immigration law growing up as a stranger in the 70s and the difficulties of racism and feeling that, feeling alienated. And then of course, you know, the striving of um, immigrant and you know parents for their kids so could you talk a little bit about sort of the immigrant aspect of this and um, you know you said something about how you wanted to write this to be um, useful to those who have gone through a tragedy but could you talk about this other aspect uh, I this is a novel about immigrants right um I, I could make the claim that Henry James is the ambassadors is also a novel about immigrants. I could make the argument that the sun also rises is a novel about immigrants. Uh, I could make the argument, you know, so I could make all these arguments as to what counts, what belongs in the genre of immigrant, in the tradition of immigrant fiction. Uh, and I could, I could make the same argument that in the sun also rises, um, you have the presence of the first person because it's a way of registering, uh, registering things that are alien. I could make the uh, argument that in the reason that The Ambassadors is the first breakthrough, first novel where we begin to get sort of the late Henry James is because this is when you begin to have the presence of uh, a, str a stranger in Paris forces introspection. Right, and so th that these that these techniques, the same things that we find in what we call immigrant fiction, which is the response of the alien, is exists in those works as well. And so the I I would say that the category of immigrant fiction is very large. There is uh, those writers are not considered immigrant writers because they're white. Uh, there is power and privilege associated with being white uh, and being considered like there is a belief that if you are writing about white people and I say this with all love I mean I really do that uh, that somehow that is more the general case the universal case the reality of course is all of this stuff is crazy you know, the reason that the metamorphosis applies to me is not because I'm a cockroach, <laughs> but because I am full of anxieties, right? The, you know, the reason that housekeeping applies to me is not because I'm a, a, a girl child. You know, the reason that the, the Charter House of Parma applies to me is not, you know, because I'm living in Italy. You know, all of these things apply to me. Uh, the things that good fiction do are the things that have been true, that are true now, have been true for hundreds of years, have been true for a thousand years bef ago, and, and will be a thousand, true a thousand years from now. That's what good fiction provides. We have these categories because they're useful shorthand. Um, like all shorthand, there are, they might misguide us as readers. They might lead us to focus uh, on the wrong thing. Um, I don't actually resist the category of being considered an immigrant writer or writing immigrant fiction, largely because I have realized that all my life I will have to deal with idiots. And so why should I devote any energy to dealing with idiots now? So, and I say this with great love. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or, okay, thank you.